It all started from raving, going to warehouse parties back in the high school days, well into the early college days, embracing the whole DJ culture, which was, for me, uh, in the mid 90s, 96, 97, when I really started um, getting interested in that subculture. You know, no matter how much my friends who went to this sort of thing would tell me about it beforehand, uh, I had no idea. Of course, once I'd gone, I understood everything they were saying. Going to raves where everyone accepted anyone for who they were, and you could look however the hell you wanted, and you could just rock out for an evening, and you didn't have to be the McDonald's employee, or you didn't have to be a grad student. You could just be you dancing. Hey, you just want to dance. You really, it just makes you want to dance. I can't go out. If there's a DJ that I really, really like and I'm going out to see somebody, there is no way that I could be in the venue with that music playing without at least a foot tapping. It's your release. It's your escape at the end of the week. You know, instead of asking for salvation, we're not asking for anything. We're just asking for a place to let go and let loose and forget about the fact that I've got a crappy job and an annoying boss or, you know, all these other things that weigh on people's lives. Um, for eight hours, late at night, I can just let loose and be somebody else if I want to be and, and not feel tied down by societal constraints or, or where people feel I should be in my life. I got involved with electronic dance music when I was probably about 15 years old. Um, first rave I went to was in 1993, some warehouse space in Seattle. Prior to that, I was involved in heavy metal bands and stuff. Found the rave culture in 93 and, and I was just hooked. Um, mainly because everybody that was there was having a great time and smiling and dancing and, and I'd never experienced something like that. We spend so much of our lives slaving away and working and worrying and working some more and then worrying about our work and then stressing out about this and that and stressing out about our relationship and whether we're gonna make five thousand dollars this week and like having music to just like escape and listen and just stop caring about all all the stress in our lives, it gives you a, a place where you can just chill out and remember to ride a rainbow to the stars. Yeah, that's really just it. I love what I do. When I spin, it's coming from the bottom of my soul because I love to do it. I love the tracks that I'm playing. I love the people that I'm playing for, it, even if I don't know you. I love you, man. <laughs> From way back in the day, you know, the, the mantra of, of the rave community was PLUR, P-L-U-R, which is, stands for Peace, Love, Unity, and Respect. Peace, Love, Unity, and Respect. Um, when I'm at a rave and I'm all candied out and wearing really super duper bright colors with my hair all done up funny, um, I'm usually bouncing around the party, talking to a whole bunch of different people, giving them stickers, trading candy, just having a good time. like. I think that's just kind of what Candy Kids represent. Our records now sell as far away as Germany and the UK to Australia. And you know, all created right here, homegrown in Seattle. And uh, the other aspect of that that's also really cool is that we get to uh, represent another side to the city, you know, which obviously has had its long history from Ray Charles, Quincy Jones, Etta James, to Jimi Hendrix, and obviously the whole grunge movement. And now here's another new uh, side, new facet to Seattle music, house music and electronic music. Definitely 
has its own thing going on, a little different than San Francisco, Chicago, or uh, European ele electronic movements. It's a brand new sound, and, and it's the evolution of how rave culture, at least in Seattle, and I would say probably in the whole United States, um, kind of went. You know, this drum and bass came in and and showed everybody a, a completely new sound, and, and it changed things around. I'm just kind of taking my inspiration from everywhere, from, you know, the mids and drum and bass to the beats of house. I really like jungle, and I really like drum and bass, but I also really love hardcore and not really hardstyle, but sometimes it can be okay, and trance is good sometimes. If it's played right, it's good. Um, club music can be catchy, but only in small doses. Same with electronic. Deep house. Dubstep, trance, progressive house. I mean, it goes on and on and on. It goes on and on. I don't even know where to begin or where to end. <laughs> That's a good thing. And I think the heyday, I mean, this is crazy. I mean, this store, I mean, this store used to be packed. You come here on a Friday, Saturday afternoon, there's people lined up to get records. Now, I mean, I have a little line. It's not like 30 or 40 deep like it used to be. And with all the new technology coming out too, and that's what's really changing is like, you have all these new digital things coming out so people can DJ pretty much off their, if they wanted to, off their telephone, off a cell phone. You can DJ off a cell phone now. So that's what I'm saying. It's just like all this new technology that's coming out, it's kind of just putting everybody in a bind. You know, it's changed from one of the days when, when the major record labels used to kind of handpick or even create bands um, just for, you know, designed for commercial success to where what I was talking about, where technology has enabled someone to, in, in their own bedroom, you know, become an amazing producer. Until 2004, I think it was, about maybe 2003, all the DJs were on vinyl. Then about 2000, CDs started coming back out, and then everybody got on CDs, and then the digital thing came out with the Serratos, your, you know, Final Scratch came out, and when Final Scratch came out, that's what really, everybody's like, wow, you could carry three, three bags of records, your back's gonna hurt. Now guess what, you got a little iPod, or. You got like a, a hard drive or a computer, thousands, millions, millions of songs, you know. You have a terabyte of songs. You can carry your whole library with you to where, as back then, you could have one set and I saw it, that set's gonna be a solid set. Now I think a lot of people are getting a lot sloppier because the fact that they have so much music to choose from, they're not really paying attention to one style of going. And I think that's what's really hurting the music scene and, and digital, digital has hurt it. I mean, I'll say it, I'll be the first to admit it. Digital has hurt us. Clear Channel owns, I think it's like 75% of the radio stations in the US and they have their set playlists. So it's all canned music, you know, boring, not very exciting uh, playlists, you know, the same thing that they play over and over and over. Uh, MTV is more, reality shows now than music, <laughs> kind of a joke. So then really the only outlets for these artists and their music is, is uh, kind of like in the disco days, you know, where it was the disco. Now it's at, at the clubs, at the, at the raves, at these underground parties where, you know, you're not dictated, it's not being dictated to you from corporate headquarters what you're gonna play. You know? It does have the potential to go bigger and become more mainstream, which there is drum and bass that is kind of mainstream, it is kind of commercial, um, which is cool uh, in a sense. I don't want it to kill the scene, I just kind of wanted to enlighten people and wake people up. A lot of mainstream media and music that is fed to us, I think, is meant to. Uh, dumb us down and get us into a place of compliance and um, you know not questioning things you know any movement that kind of rejects the mainstream especially commercialism and, and consumerism as a way of life you know is going to be threatening to certain uh, certain established uh, forces and you know, and, and I think anytime there's something's viewed as a threat like that, it has to be marginalized. Now it's it's much more commercial. You know, you go to your high schools and you see ravers just like you'd see jocks. You didn't see that in 1993. It was, you know, you didn't know who went to the rave. They weren't wearing candy necklaces and jewelry and stuff like that. It didn't really exist. You hear the music on the radio 
back then you, you didn't. It was completely under, unheard of, totally underground. There was a mystique to it, you know, and people were drawn to it. But then it started to become mainstream when the promoters found out that they could start making a lot of money on it. Then the vendors came in and things just kind of changed, you know, and uh, don't get me wrong, I still love to play big parties today, you know, and it's just not the same vibe as it was back then, simply because it's not underground anymore. All right, cool, cool. I just like, I like to point out though that Bass Hunter is amazing and we should have got that booking like I wanted. No, 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 bullshit. You said nobody would know who Bass Hunter was. And I was like, you were crazy. And he made you look him up on Wikipedia. We were the last show, and you never got any word back from that guy. You kept saying he emailed him and shit, and you never heard anything. I'm mad as fuck that Bass Hunter's playing somewhere else, and I wanted to bring him. Not only that it's trying to stop my show, but the fact that he's playing at another show. But Beefer's trying to move the date to June 6th. I'm trying to help him and just smooth things over. You know, because... Yeah, he's already moved to the Sunday. He's trying to move it to June 6th. I told him I'd do anything he needed to get him to June 6th. Because it doesn't make any sense to have Blackout, which is a major event, one weekend. The very next weekend, have Bubble Bobble and Bass Hunter. That would be Bass Hunter, Irene, and IC all on the same weekend. And then the next weekend, have USC, which God knows who Chad's bringing. Paul Oakenfold, Tiesto, and Crystal Method, and... God knows what else, right? And that would just not make any sense. That's $60 for Chad's show on that weekend. $30 to $35 on our weekend for our show. $30 to $35 for Beefer's show. And $30 to $35 for Monkey's show. And the economy's down? This is retarded. You're putting a strain on these kids. With the dance community, it's, it's more of a, um, almost like a, a Buddhist approach, you know, where you know, respect and, and valuing that, that kind of uh, interaction between people is like at the core of, of, of the values that, that you, you uh, appreciate and, that, and that's what you want to create in your life. You know, so it, it really becomes more than just about the music. The music is what kind of brings it all together and makes it all happen, but really it extends to more than that. It's, okay, this is how I want to live life and, you know, I reject the uh, the external forces that say, you know, you're, you're not good enough, you're insecure, you're, you know, whatever, all these negative mes messages that you get from TV, from commercials, you know, a lot of it is intended to sell products, you know, they make people feel like they need this product to be whole, to be better, and you know, when you reject that and you say, you know, I'm, I'm fine just the way I am, and... Um, I, there's no reason why I should feel any less and you know you find like-minded people like that and create your own community where you don't fall victim or prey to all those external forces you know rather you try to elevate. Stacy of Seattle is like a branch well it's a branch off of Dance Safe which is like it's Dance Safe. <laughs> they don't promote drug use but they don't tell you not to do drugs they give you straight up information about it just the cold hard facts like what something will do to you and long-term effects negative effects positive effects whatever it's just information it's unbiased and I think that's a really important thing to have on the rave scene I mean obviously the main negative you're gonna come up with uh, the the dance culture in general is just gonna be ecstasy um, maybe a little little bit of cocaine will be brought up but the main thing that's gonna be brought up is ecstasy um, and I see it's one of those drugs when people take it, they look ridiculous. <laughs> it's, it's pretty hard to hide it. You know, people walking around just like, you know, with, with, with faces like that, glow sticks. Um, and people who don't understand the culture at all, they're just, you know, think that that's a major drug addict and that they're totally strung out, although they're causing way less harm than, you know, the guy smoking crack in the alley behind it, um, or even the people getting belligerently drunk at the club next door. There's too much liability being placed on the people who are trying to throw parties rather than just having somebody organize an event and having people be responsible for themselves because ultimately we are responsible for ourselves. I don't really feel like we need nanny nanny coming in and you know watching over us and making sure this and that. If you're gonna do drugs and be stupid and mess up in the club, that's your bad. That shouldn't reflect on the rest of the whole culture. 
there are a lot of people who are under the influence, but there are also a lot of people who are sober. Like, since last summer, it's become more of a popular thing to be sober. Um, last summer, I was really popular, and so was my friend group. Like, we were rave royalty, according to other people, which is really hilarious to me. But, um, and we all promoted the idea that ravers should be sober, so I've noticed that since then there have like most of the ravers who have come in a lot of them have been sober which is really nice to see kids just like having a great time but not feeling like they need to be under the influence of anything what i saw was a lot of troubled teens including myself like i i was a troubled teen so i was going to these these underground parties to kind of get away from life and whatnot so you know you get in, introduced to drugs you start taking drugs well eventually you look around and you realize that everybody around you is is on drugs, including the DJs who you hold in this really high regard. I mean, anybody who's gone to a rave has experienced that. I mean, it's it's an amazing spiritual experience. And I got to the point where I was just looking around and everybody's high on, on you know, meth, including the DJs. And I was just like, this is, this is, this is garbage. Like, this isn't real. And that was a lot of reason why I started DJing is because I wanted to be the sober DJ. You know, I wanted to be the person that people could actually get real energy from, not this this synthetic energy. Um, so that was very important to me. And for me, it was it was also an excuse for me to get sober because I didn't want to be the DJ that had to be high on meth in order to DJ, which I, when I was going to parties in the beginning, that was how it was, and, and it, was just, it was kind of disgusting. Mikey down there, I'm gonna send some people to start checking them in. Get checked in, checking your co check stuff. And remember, the only time you get your co check is now. I want the kids to be safe, so I'll, I'll keep my hand in it probably forever. I mean, there'll always be me kind of coming back and making sure the kids are safe in Seattle, and making sure that raves don't go back to being these underground, you know, break-in parties with high risks, with no security. So Seattle uh, likes to enjoy the, the idea that it has this huge diverse music scene. And it, it does, it has a pretty diverse music scene. It has a lot of music history and it's really proud of its it's like mid 90s, early 90s music scene, which, you know, rocked the world. Um, but one of the things that kind of happened in the shadow at the same time that was all happening was Seattle's crazy rave scene, the old Cat in the Hat cruise and all the early raves in Seattle. And the city just kind of ignores that part of its history um, like it didn't happen because that's not music as far as they're concerned. And so over the years, the city stance on raves is as long as it stays kind of in the dark, it's not an issue. But as soon as we start to have some momentum, we get kind of quashed down because they don't want to be known as a city of electronic music. But we are the city where there's Microsoft. We are the city where there's Boeing. Every major tech developer in the world pretty much comes out of Seattle or does business in Seattle. So here's the music of technology, but it's not allowed in the most technological city in the world. You know, people couldn't dance for a minute there just because it was um, associated with you know drug culture or something. So you couldn't have a gathering of people and actually have people dance, which seemed very sci-fi Orwellian, you know, to me, to limit people's expression. There was this period of time when it felt like the city was really declaring war on kids having fun. Like they wanted us to just stay in the suburbs or stay at home, not leave our houses. Passing some new laws, like holding clubs accountable, but holding clubs accountable for stuff they shouldn't even be accountable for. Like they're accountable for if a bum starts a fight across the street from their club now. Like, and so I mean, if something completely out of their control happens, the club gets cracked down on. One of the main problems for me with it is that uh, the the agency that is trying, or the the specific license that is trying to require, which would apply to about anywhere from three to four hundred businesses, uh, <clears throat> places all the power to suspend or revoke a business's liquor license in the hands of one individual who is appointed by the mayor. There's a rave almost every weekend in this city, sometimes more than one, sometimes more than one in one night. There are renegade parties and legal parties all happening in the city, right? So on any one weekend night, there could be up to 2,000 kids at an electronic music event in Seattle. 
Our last incident was three years ago. When I read the, the Rave Act, it seemed very restrictive. And it, you know, I don't know if they did that when alcohol was illegal, if you could forfeit your property, if, if they caught you with alcohol on your, your, I don't know if that's how that happened then, but it does seem like, you know, you could go to the baseball game and be rolling. And, you know, they wouldn't lose the, the fields, lose the you know. The stadium wouldn't be forfeited by whoever owns it, you know, whatever bank or whatever owns it now. But it, so that seems like it's very punitively directed towards a certain segment of youth and, and music community. The media over the years, these, the, the government, you know, let me get to the point. The government, the police, parents, the only way they've ever seen rave is through that little television box. From those, from the, that same footage that's been repeated over and over again. Uh, that's it, that, I mean, that's how they see rave. Unless you're a parent who went up and said, well, what is a rave? And you went and you went on YouTube and you looked at other pictures, or if you're a parent that goes to a rave, you know, there are parents who bring their kids to my rave, and not only do they bring their kids to raves, they get out and pay for their kids and are like, hey, have the kids, see you later, mom and I, dad and I are gonna have a good time. <laughs> and they bolt off um, because they're very comfortable and they're very aware of what their kids are doing. As far as the police and the climate here, it's everything closes at two, so if you're in a club, you're all right, it's all good. Um, I've actually played some functions outside of the city that were on private property and like ATF rolled up, like assault tactical rifles and shit on somebody's property. I kind of felt like they were dangerous too. Like before I went to one, I planned extensively with one of my friends like, okay, we have to have this really intricate buddy system. If I go to the bathroom, you go to the bathroom, we can't leave each other alone, otherwise someone's going to get dosed with GHB and raped. But after I went to a rave, my perspective on it completely changed. <laughs> And I realized that it was this really welcoming environment and people aren't as judgmental as they are in the real world. This shift has definitely been organic. I don't really think that there is necessary concerted effort. Like there were never like, oh, we're all gonna get together and march on Olympia or march on City Hall. I mean, I think that that's not really congruent with how the rave culture necessarily enacts change. I mean, I think, a lot of people took the stance of like, well, this is what I love and this is what I do, and I'm still going to continue doing it in the face of all of these challenges. And I think when the city saw that, like, just because you're going to say you can't do it doesn't mean the kids are going to stop going to these events. And they started having events outside the city limits, so city laws didn't apply. And they just saw that there was no real stopping people who were wanting to have, have these events and have fun. So I think at a certain level, they understand that they were fighting a losing battle. Let us party in peace. <laughs> That's all we want to do. We have this, the, the parties at the Pacific Science Center. At the Pacific Science Center, you know, you have the dinosaur room, which looks like Jurassic Park. All the, it's, a, it's a children's science learning center, so you have all the toys and all the things that people can play with. And, you know, it makes it a little bit more interesting than just a regular old club. And then uh, at the same time with, you know, not one single incidence of anything getting damaged, not one single incident of violence with, you know, 1,500 people there. Uh, they were pretty amazed that something that large could go on uh, without and, and still be so chill. We need some serious accelerated spiritual evolution on this planet right now. I think that's more necessary than anything. You know, there's no genre of music except electronic music that has taken me into a trance into you know a place where i'm not in my body anymore you wouldn't think that matching the beat of one record to another record would be difficult and then on top of that to blend them in a way where the music's going to continuously build and create m more of a of a energy you know, it's, it's, it's all about building energy and then releasing the energy and breaking it down and building it up again. So it, it's, it's very difficult to do. Um, and anyone who thinks that it wouldn't, you know, I challenge them to try to get behind two turntables and, and get, you know, 100 people dancing because it's, 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 it's not an, an easy task.
It gets my feet dancing. It gets me into a space of, you know, pure joy. So if it's not music, then you know, I want to know what it is. Because it's fucking good. <laughs> If that's not music, then, um, then, you know, I've got a lot to learn. It moves me. Just like, you know, Mel Torme moved my grandpa. There's just some sort of mystery behind how does it come off the record into the needle. I love that, dude. I love everything from the way it smells when you open it up to when you first pop it on the plate. <laughs> The element of community, you know, where everyone had each other's back, people would do anything for you. You know, you had maybe kids that were even what their family couldn't provide for them, these friends would. I just want to continue seeing people celebrate. I mean, that's why we're doing what we do, you know, we're celebrating life. I don't know where electronic music is heading. I think that's kind of an unpredictable question. Sometimes it it feels like everything's been done and you can't do any more with it because so many things have been done, but then you have other people coming out with stuff that just blows your mind that you can't even fathom how they came up with it. And it's, they're creating everything from scratch. You know, they're creating their drums from scratch. And I don't know where electronic music is going. And I think that's part of the fun of it is just, it's, it's like a ride. It's not about the end point. It's about the journey. Nobody else.